All right. I think we can uh, start. Uh, I uh, would like to welcome you all to today's uh, policy forum on uh, Lebanon. Before we start, I would like just to explain a couple of logistical technical details. Um, the, we have uh, the option of simultaneous translation, but if you want to hear the uh, uh, translation, there is at an interpretation bottom on the right side of the screen at the bottom. It's called interpretation. You click it and you choose the channel that you want, which is you have two options, Arabic or English, because we have one speaker with us who speaks Arabic and he, you will be offered the simultaneous English translation. So if you wanna hear him in Arabic, you click Arabic. If you wanna hear him in English, you click English. Uh, otherwise, uh, the Q&A at the very end, those who are in the Zoom app, you can use the chat box in order to ask your questions. Those who are watching uh, the live stream online, you can send your questions to policy forum, one word, at washingtoninstitute.org. That is policy forum at washingtoninstitute.org. All right. So as most of you have seen or heard, yesterday the dollar has reached an unprecedented level in Lebanon of 10,000 lira. And this is something that has been expected. Uh, the electricity sector is suffering where Lebanon's really facing a serious black, black, blackout throughout the, uh, 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 everywhere in Lebanon. Political assassinations have returned. The uh, deadlock in the government formation is still ongoing. People took to the streets again yesterday in Lebanon. Uh, and we are looking at different, uh, non, maybe non, not necessarily nonstop protests, but uh, on and off kind of street protests that would uh, 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 come back from time to time, every time the collapse becomes more apparent. Since October 2019, Lebanon has been experiencing the worst economic crisis in its history. With rampant inflation, coupled with growing unemployment, throwing more than half of the Lebanese people under the poverty line. Meanwhile, all efforts, including the French initiative, in, have failed to get the political class to implement reforms, even the minimal kind of reforms, or even to form a government. It would seem that Hezbollah, which is the main decision maker in Lebanon, prefers that the country stays as is and to have actually the state institutions collapse, uh, such as the Venezuela scenario that everyone is talking today about in Lebanon, instead of any kind of reforms and any change in the system. But Hezbollah faces a real dilemma here. Reform means a possible loss of control that they have gained in 2018 when they won the parliament and then the government and they got the president of their choosing. But the current collapse is also costing them their support base and the much needed access to state institutions. Faced with a lose-lose situation, Hezbollah probably was hoping for a quick US-Iran deal that would lead to fast financial relief to the party where they will have access to hard currency. And this will make them the most powerful party in Lebanon by far. But this obviously is not happening. So today they have to deal with the situation as the collapse happens fast. So what is Hezbollah planning for in the next phase of the collapse? What can we expect from the street? Are we going to see more riots, violence? What is happening today in Lebanon? How can the Biden administration respond to the people's aspirations and at the same time contain Iran's role in destroying what is left in Lebanon? And why is all that important for the international community? Today, to answer these questions, we have three great speakers from Beirut, based in Beirut. We have Makram Rabah, who is a professor at the, of history at the American University in Beirut. 
We have Ali Al-Amin, who is the editor-in-chief of Janubia, in an online newspaper that covers Lebanon, but mainly Shia politics. And we have Ali Mansour, who is a columnist who writes about the region in general. She's based in, Le in Beirut, but she's also a Syria expert who will talk to us about the regional context of, of Lebanon. Um, Please uh, join us in welcoming the three speakers from Beirut who are, uh, we'd like to thank for joining us today. Uh, we would like to start with Makram, who will speak for 10 minutes, then Ali, and then Alia. And then we will take Q&A from, uh, from, from the audience. Uh, Makram, the floor is yours. Good afternoon uh, or good morning, depending where you are. Thank you, Hanin. It's always a pleasure to speak at the Washington Institute and uh, to interact with a lot of friends and uh, colleagues. Last time I spoke in an open forum at the Washington Institute, Luqman was with us. We spoke back in November of 2019. We were almost a month into the revolution. I was very spirited and so was Hanin. We were very uh, optimistic with what was happening. Whereas Luqman was a bit apprehensive and a bit fearful of the revolution. We were trying to make out how long would this revolution take or how, where would it take us? Uh, he had uh, these concerns and rightfully so, a month and two after, the, after this uh, talk we had at the Washington Institute, me and Luqman were attacked at our uh, tent, which is called The Hub. This was a forum where we had interacted with a number of people. We had 45 lectures talking about different issues under the auspices and the patronage of the Civic Influence Hub, the CIH. Obviously, because we spoke at the Washington Institute and because of our quote unquote pro-American stance, we were targeted by Hezbollah. And this is exactly what uh, Luqman was fearful of. This is what we call the Hezbollah, the whiskey drinkers of Hezbollah, these left-wing activists who claim to be uh, fighting corruption and asking for a uh, for, for a sovereign state, but in fact, these are infiltrators and people who are uh, 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 planted by Hezbollah. The issue here that whoever killed Luqman uh, knew well what Luqman was doing. He knew the influence that Luqman had on the ground, and more importantly, it was more of a preemptive strike. Luqman paid the price for being a very eloquent and a very outspoken critic of Hezbollah, but more so someone who was proud of his American connections, these connections were, uh, were public. These connections were, uh, were forged over uh, uh, large amounts of alcohol and good food in Beirut and in DC. And we never shy away from saying what we believe in. And me and Luqman and many people around this room are very outspoken, be it with the, with the Lebanese revolution or with the Syrian revolution. And this is why Luqman ultimately paid the price. If you are still wondering who killed Luqman, you're in the wrong place, guys. Uh, people who killed Luqman are people who have been uh, hijacking the state for a long time. Uh, people who are still hoping that the Biden administration will sell the pro-sovereign people down the river. Uh, it is betting on this ridiculous rhetoric that Hezbollah has a military and a political wing. It is basically as if you are trying to tell me that these people are the uh, uh, the Girl Scouts of America, and they sell cookies. They sell Thin Mints, and they sell shortbread cookies. These people are an armed, security-obsessed uh, and security-minded people whose only obsession is to stay active on the Mediterranean, as well as in different regions around the world. Luqman knew well that he will not be able to win an overnight fight, but our, uh, we were going all the way, all the way in the sense that we were refusing to allow these public spaces to be occupied by Hezbollah and more importantly, by their allies in the Lebanese government, as well as in the American government, because we had a number of diplomats that would come to Lebanon and give them the Kodak moment. Uh, we had a number of diplomats, both from the Democratic administration, as well as from Republican administration early on, that would come and sit with one of the most corrupt politicians in the history of modern Lebanon, and here I'm talking about Jibran Basile, and simply this would bring him back to the table, so to speak. We had this exercise back in 06, that every time a Western diplomat would visit Syria or would visit the region, one of us would be killed. Simply, they kill because they know that they can get away with it. They kill simply because they know that the Lebanese state cannot summon 
even a doorman or the coffee boy that makes coffee for Hassan Nasrullah, they can get away with it that because they don't, they don't only use silencers, but they have a whole army of cyber bullies who go after us and who make us feel uncomfortable. Maybe not me, but my entire family. And this makes you very anxious, especially that we do not do this for a living. We are not politicians. And Luqman was not a politician, neither an activist. Luqman was a publisher, and he was a person who was obsessed with the archive and preserving the history and the memory of the civil war. And this is how I knew him. Our problem is that people do not realize yet that we are still fighting two models, either the model of Hassan Nasrullah and this so-called obsession with acquiring ballistic missiles and convincing us that the only way to get out of this economic collapse is to grow potatoes in our backyard, or we go towards China, and both of these options are uh, ridiculous not to say naive, or we have the option of what I call the Anrami platform. And Anrami is a, is a platform that looks like Spotify. It's a spot, Arabic Spotify. These people opened in 2012, and these people are now valued at 120 million. Okay, recently they had to leave. They left to the UAE, to the United Arab Republic, because simply it was no longer an option to do business. If these guys actually walk to Nasrallah and tell him that you need to cool it down because we cannot do business, most probably he will tell them that you need to fight the good fight because we want to destroy and throw the Jews and the Israelis into the sea. And he would suggest that these same people who have developed this very fine interactive uh, uh, music, Arabic music platform to go and sell uh, pirated uh, DVDs on some intersection. This is, these are the people that we are dealing with. If it comes to me, yesterday David Schenker gave a very good uh, talk to, to Arabia, and he said that the maximum pressure campaign is not being conducted by the United States which I agree with, the maximum pressure campaign is being conducted by the militias of Iran, be it in Ma'rib, be it in Saudi Arabia, be it in Lebanon through the killing of Luqman, and but what they are doing in different parts of Syria. Simply, we cannot back away from this fight. So far, the Biden administration has been clear that it will not replicate the Obama model, which is fine, because simply, I actually don't care to convince you that you should do what's good for Lebanon. You should do what's good for the US. What's good for the US is not to allow impunity. It's not good to allow good people such as Luqman, people who believe, believe in the liberal arts education and liberal arts value to be executed in the south of Lebanon after a long night of drinking. To add insult to injury, we've been months into the killing of Luqman and the Lebanese state has done nothing. It has just been able to bully us and try to convince us that they are trying to investigate, to try to find out who killed Luqman. We already know who killed Luqman. Whoever killed Luqman is the same person who killed Rafi al-Hariri and who killed tens of other people and who has went into Syria and tried to convince us that they are fighting ISIS while in fact they are butchering innocent Syrians and innocent civilians and kids and women. If Luqman was here, he would actually have used the quote behind me, which is justice even if the heavens fall. Al-Adil hatta law saqat al-sama. And Sayyid Ali Amin was telling me that you are optimistic. I am not optimistic. You cannot be a friend of Luqman and actually, uh, sorry, be pessimistic. You cannot be a pessimist if you know Luqman's name. We have been fighting these hoodlums and here the hoodlums are not only Hezbollah and people usually come to me and tell me, why are you obsessed with Hezbollah? Why do you only talk about Hezbollah? Actually, they don't listen to what we say. Me, Ali, Hanin, Ali, and all these people, we say that Hezbollah is part of the problem because Hezbollah has a militia that provides cover and security and protection for the people who are uh, embezzling the resources of the state. Uh, Hanin started off by telling you about the terrible living conditions. My salary at UB is 60 million Lebanese pounds, which is for someone who teaches history, it's around $5,000. And this is so far. So in the next couple of weeks, maybe uh, this will not be enough for me even to uh, pump gas into my car. The problem is not, about, is not financial. The reason why I talk about Hezbollah, because I cannot be talking about uh, uh, basically the immigration of birds. I cannot be talking about the lack of water, which is also a problem. But the problem here is that Hassan Nasrullah is trying to convince us that what he's doing is normal and turning Lebanon into a Spartan state and an open state of warfare 
not with Israel, because for me, he's protecting actually the northern border of Israel. He's actually an open war with the Gulf, the Arabs, and more importantly, with the Lebanese themselves. He can kill us, he can bully us, he can make us starve, but simply he cannot convince us that his model is normal. Whatever you want to say about it, what the Biden administration should do is simply call them out. What the Biden administration should do, and this is something which I was attacked on, that I was inviting sanctions against the Lebanese. Yes, I ask any policymaker, be it American, European, Chinese, or from Mars, to continue sanctioning not Hezbollah. Hezbollah is trivial in this sense for the fact that Hezbollah is a non-state actor which lives like a, a mafia. It, 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 it runs a racketeering business and it can acquire money illicitly. However, the people who claim to be statesmen, people like Jubran Basile and the rest of the Lebanese political elite, and here I mean all of them, I'm not signaling out anyone. The Magnitsky Act is a very good approach and we have to thank our friends in the former administration. However, I would like to remind you that all of you or the DC crowd were obsessed with Jamal Khashoggi and they decided to name actually, I think around DuPont. Jamal Khashoggi is no different from Luqman Slim. And because I know Luqman personally, and uh, please uh, accept this, I think that Luqman is much important than Jamal. Jamal did not have the intellectual package that Luqman has. And certainly Jamal Khashoggi is not a Western oriented and a Western enlightened thinker. Luqman's case should be treated equally like Khashoggi. We already know who killed Khashoggi and we are still trying to get justice for, at least Khashoggi will get justice because his killers ultimately admitted what they did. However, the killers of Luqman should be sanctioned for corruption, they should be sanctioned for racketeering, and they should be sanctioned for the killers that they are. The people that killed Luqman did not silence him with six bullets, five to the back and one to the head. They silenced him by convincing people that Luqman is a radical, that Luqman is inviting sanctions, and that Luqman actually wants to target, physically target Hezbollah. Luqman was simply drawing to the simple fact that we cannot allow Hezbollah and this political class to become normal. Although they have been able to destroy Lebanon, although they were able to turn uh, one of the greatest countries, I think, with ed education and healthcare and uh, a, a lot of good food into a cesspool. Remember, whatever, it, whoever is in the White House, be it, be it a Republican or a Democratic president, what's important is not to allow people to walk over you and basically sell the Lebanese down the river because simply your investment in Lebanon has been, uh, been happening since the 80s and even before. And I teach a course to my students at UB about American, um, the United States and the Middle East. You have to continue using soft power. You should continue providing us with a safety net. Uh, here, I'm not talking about the institutions which don't exist. I'm talking about the people of Lebanon. And most importantly, go for the kill. The kill is sanctioning these murderers and these corrupt politicians who allow Hezbollah to sit at the cabinet table and act as if they were policymakers while in fact they are simple hoodlums which only drink the blood of the Lebanese people as well as the people of the area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Makram. Uh, I will come back to you with a question after all the speakers are done. And I'm sure uh, everybody's looking forward to hear from Ali uh, on the uh, Hezbollah intra-Shia dynamics. Uh, uh, go ahead, Ali. Just remember uh, that شكراً, yeah, شكراً translation is available for Ali. المشاركين واللي يشاركون في هذا اللقاء و يعني ابدا بالتاكيد وبتبني كل ما قاله زميلي مكرم في وخاصه فيما يتعلق بموضوع اغتيال لقمان سليم لانه ذلك سيكون التعامل مع هذه القضيه سيكون مؤشر على كيف يتم التعامل مع لبنان على وجه العموم وأكمل حيث انتهى زميلي وأقول لبنان 
وسط ركام الانهيار شبه الكامل ولا ولا يزال يعول على دور القوى العسكريه والامنيه كرافعه تجنب الانهيار التام بعد سقوط قطاعات ماليه السقوط المدوي للعمله اللبنانيه واقتصاديه وتجاريه وطبيه وتعليميه ومستويات الخدمات والمعيشه والمواد الغذائيه الى اخره لكن كل ذلك ورغم المشهد الخطير لا يزال سيناريو الحرب الأهلية مستبعدا بالنظر إلى الإجماع السياسي في لبنان رغم التباينات والخصومات على رفض استعادة الحرب نتيجة القناعة بعدم جدواها وحتى القدرة على خوضها وتحمل تبعاتها ثالثا صحيح أن الوضع الأمني يثير الخوف والقلق ويش تفلتا وتدهورا كبيرين سرقات جرائم اعتداءات احتكاكات طائفية أو سياسية لكنه لا يرتقي إلى مستوى الحرب الأهلية التسويات السياسية مرجحة خاصة الصفقات الإيرانية الأمريكية حول لبنان التي يمكن أن تحدث بعد حين ومع الأسف التسويات الآتية حتما ستكون مع إنتاج وإخراج المنظومة الحاكمة الحالية بحسب ما يشير إليه ميزان القوى الذي يميل إلى حزب الله ومنظومة الحكم التي يحميها وتحميه وهذه الحقيقة لها أسباب عدة أولاً عجزت انتفاضة تشرين 17 تشرين في لبنان ولأسباب مختلفة عن إفراز قيادة كاريزمية من كل الطوائف قادرة على إقامة ميزان قوى مع الطبقة الطائفية الحاكمة والمتجذرة ثانيا تغطية حزب الله لهذه المنظومة الطائفية الحاكمة من ناحية لأنه لا يمتلك مشروعا محليا لبنانيا سياسيا بل توجها إقليميا ولأن إيديولوجيته من ناحية أخرى لم تتصالح بعد مع مفهوم الدولة الوطنية أو المدنية وهو بهذا المعنى أقرب مصلحيا إلى السياسات الطائفية منها إلى التوجهات المدنية رابعا عدم نضج الهوية الوطنية اللبنانية على رغم تبني 40% من اللبنانيين وبعد 17 تشرين الانتماء متجاوز للطائفية وفق استطلاعات الرأي وهذا رقم مهم للغاية وقادر على تعديل موازين القوى مع الطبقة الطائفية لكن غياب نخبة وطنية موحدة وكاريزمية وتاريخية يحول دون التبلور النهائي للهوية الوطنية ومعها مشروع الخلاص الوطني خلاصات في هذا السياق التسويات المقبلة الداخلية منها والخارجية وهي كما أسلفنا أنها مرجحة ستعيد إنتاج النظام الطائفي لكن ثم تنافذة أمل بولادة الوطنية اللبنانية فتحت منذ العام 2005 ثم في تشرين 2019 وهي لا تزال تبحث عن بطل أو أبطال يخرجها من القوة, من القوة إلى الفعل حسب تعبير الفلاسفة وإذا كان لنا أن نتفائل فلنتذكر مقولة فرناند برودل الشهيرة عن أن التاريخ هو حصيلة الآماد الطويلة لا الأحداث القصيرة أو حتى الحروب والأوبئة والآماد الطويلة لولادة لبنان الوطني بدأت وهي لم تعد تحتاج سوى لقليل من الحظ التاريخي وقليل من الأبطال التاريخيين في عجالة سأتناول أثر قتل لقمان سليم وخطاب البطريرك بشار الراعي الذي ألقي قبل أيام على البيئة الشيعية من خلال بعض الملاحظات والاستنتاجات قتل الناشط والباحث لقمان سليم قبل أقل من شهر رسخ في اللاوعي الشيعي العام حالة خوف راسخ لن يجاهر بالتعبير عنها وستترك أثرها على طريقة تعبيره عن موقفه حيث سيتردد كثيرا في التعبير الصريح وإذا كان معترضا فسيخفي اعتراضه سيجد المعارضون الشيعة صعوبة في تعميق علاقاتهم ببيئتهم الشيعية أو تعميم قناعاتهم سيجدون أن حالة الرفض لهم ستقوى بعضها بسبب العصب الشيعي المشدود والبعض الآخر بسبب التردد والحذر 
وحتى الخوف من العواقب خطاب البطريرك بشار الراعي لن يجد له سبيلا داخل البيئة الشيعية بحكم الإقفال والإحاطة التامين لوصول المعلومة والرأي داخل البيئة الشيعية هنالك حالة فصل نفسي وذهني بين البيئة الشيعية ومحيطها يجعل وصول رسالة البطريرك مشوها ومحرفا ومؤولا حالة الريبة تجاه الخارج وتعميم الخوف الضمني في الداخل عطل أي حيوية داخلية وألغى إمكانيات النقاش الحر والمفتوح هنالك تململ شيعي نعم لكن لم يرتقي ليصير حالة أو يخلق مشهدا رديفا بسبب السطوة التي يمارسها حزب الله على بيئته وسياسة الترغيب والترهيب الممنهجة ربما السبيل الوحيد لإحداث تغيير داخلي هو إما تنامي قوة منافسة ذات طاقات تعبوية وإمكانات مادية وإعلامية ودولية يمكنها مواجهة قوى الأمر الواقع وإما بحدوث أحداث درامية تتصل بالتحالفات الإقليمية ولا سيما في سوريا أو وصول الأمور في الداخل أو وصول الأمور في الداخل إلى حال فقدان السيطرة عليها باختصار الوضع الآن مقفل داخل البيئة الشيعية والترتيب والتراتبية التي خلقها الثنائي الشيعي أي أمل وحزب الله بقيادة حزب الله داخل هذه البيئة لم يستنفذ أغراضه وطاقته وهذا الأمر يرهن أيضا مستقبل لبنان تبعا لما ستؤول عليه أوضاعها ومسار راعيها أوضاع الثنائية أقصد ومسار راعيها أقصد الإيراني وشكرا Thank you, Ali. Uh, fascinating. Um, we'll, I'll come back to you as well with more questions later about the Shia community per se, but I would like to hear from Alia now uh, about the regional perspective and Lebanon in the context of the region, especially Syria and, and, and Iran in general. Go ahead. You are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, as I see the problem in, of uh, Lebanon, it, it's part of a regional problem which many countries controlled by Iran are suffering from. The collapse is in Lebanon is also happening in Iraq and in Syria, even if it has different characteristics in each country and appears to be more complicated in Lebanon and more bloody in Syria. But it is Iran's agenda. Uh, it's based on destroying the concept of the state itself in, in favor of the concept of militias, especially in Lebanon, where Hezbollah is Iran's spoiled uh, baby. In my opinion, the 17 October movement made a, a mistake. Uh, many of the groups participated made a mistake, but by not noticing the complexity of Lebanon's problem. Corruption is wide, uh, widely spread in institution, but it cannot be fought without fighting its main cause, which is the absence of the state in favor of militia. Some, some, uh, some of them tried to neutralize the issue of weapons and of Hezbollah from the movement's demands, but they did not answer the simple question, which is, how can you fight corruption if you cannot yeah, simply control your borders, which results in smuggling and all what, uh, what happens there? Where you can, where you can, when you can extend the state authority, it, it would become easier to hold the remaining corrupt accountable. But if you could not, then the whole issue would take a sectarian dimension. Why, would, why uh, should we fight the corruption of the Sunnis if we cannot fight, uh, fight the corruption of the Shia? Why hold the Druze accountable if the Christians' officials are a red line? Things are connected and complicated. And the solution start by finding a solution to the issue of the arms, the, the issue of the militia. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not just a Lebanese problem. It is a regional problem. Anything other than that, it's a partial solution, in my opinion, that does not cure the main cause of the issue. Uh, we see on daily basis repetition of the saying, Hezbollah is silent on the corruption of others in exchange of their silence of its weapons. And this is false. 
and dangerous to keep repeating it uh, because it indicates, uh, ind indicates that Hezbollah itself is not corrupt. While we should, by now, everyone knows that it, it is corrupted from uh, selling uh, false medicine to uh, controlling legal and illegal borders to the tax evasion to the money laundering and drug dealing. Hezbollah has been murdering the Lebanese and the Syrians for years. And they started with the Lebanese in 2005 and maybe years er earlier. And now they have been killing the Syrians for uh, four years now. Until now, we honestly could not feel that there is a serious act against them. And by serious, I mean making them pay for what they did and not just give them with their partners a new chance waiting for them to change the, their behavior. And honestly, with Biden administration, I don't think we can be very optimistic about this. And I hope I'm wrong. All right. All right. Uh, okay, so I'm going to ask each of you a question and then I would like uh, to uh, ask the audience again if they want to uh, ask a question, you can use the chat box, uh, the Q&A, sorry, the Q&A box in the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A icon, you can click on it and write your question. Uh, if uh, uh, you are on live stream, you can send your questions to uh, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org and I will collect all the questions and convey them to the uh, speakers. Uh, so please let me know if you have any questions. But while you do that, I would like to start with Makram. Uh, from your talk, uh, it's not looking good. You said you are not pessimistic, but what you said is actually the way you describe the situation doesn't look good at all. With the current situation, things are going to get worse. Uh, that's that's basically what we're expecting is worse uh, political, economic security collapse as well. So we're looking at more security incidents, internal security incidents. And this is where I still wonder what is Hezbollah plan ahead of that? So are they going to interfere again in turning the in, in, in um, uh, cracking on the protesters like they did in the, in the past wave of the protests? Are they going to continue political assassination? Uh, what is the role of the security institutions, especially the Lebanese army in this sense? Uh, we know that the the the, uh, um, the situation, the economic situation is also hitting the uh, people within the security institutions. The salary of a, a, a Lebanese army soldier is now reduced from, I don't know, $1,000 to $100, and it's gonna get worse. How is this soldier going to deal with the security situations when they are asked to go and face the protesters themselves? So what is gonna happen when really things go out of hand with more riots, more violence? And we saw in Tripoli that what happened is that uh, they 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 are now charging the protesters who participated in the Tripoli uh, protests last time with terrorism charges, and that is very dangerous precedence. You know, like if you go to the street now, you are considered a terrorist. So, what is the uh, army and other security institutions' uh, uh, role, especially that basically the international community? especially the US, they have some kind of leverage within these security institutions in terms of aid, whether the Europeans with security forces or the US with the army. So what leverage can be used? What are the tools that can be used? Can this be controlled in a way? And in general, how Hezbollah is going to deal with this whole situation when we hear a lot of talk about Hezbollah pushing actually for more collapse in order for them to change the system from whatever Ta'if implemented or like needs to be implemented from Ta'if to something new with more, with a different kind of power sharing where the Shia will have more uh, uh, share in the parliament instead mm -hmm. of, of, of the current uh, half Christian, half, 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 half Muslim uh, share. Mm -hmm. So this is a question for you. Uh, Ali, um, 
I think what I understood also from your uh, talk is that the Shia community really is isolated and there's no hope of whether there's discontent, the growing discontent, uh, everything that is happening uh, uh, within the Shia community, the signs of discontent within the Shia community um, is not going to change anything because Hezbollah is making sure that they are isolating this discontent. But at the end of the day, this is, is this going to have any influence on Hezbollah within the community? Is this going to push Hezbollah to deal with the Shia in a different way? Is it going to change uh, uh, the support base from uh, loyalty and love for Hezbollah and the resistance, whatever, to, to, to more fear and uh, uh, more isolation? Um, uh, Alia, uh, my question for you is the connection really, like how do you see the connection between Lebanon and Syria in two ways? One, the collapse of the economies mm -hmm. happening simultaneously at the same time is interesting. So why is this happening? Uh, how is Syria uh, benefiting also from the, 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 still until today, there is a lot of smuggling going from Lebanon to Syria. So can you tell us a little bit about the smuggling? What are the uh, uh, Lebanese or Hezbollah taking to Syria and how is the, the uh, regime involved in all that? And can you tell us a little bit also about this, all reports coming from different sources about the Syrian regime involvement in the uh, Beirut blast? Uh, the, the nitrates that came to Beirut through Hezbollah that were going to be used in Syria for, for bombs. So uh, this, these links, the security, the economy, the, 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 the political links between the two regimes, how do you see this evolving? Uh, how do you see this impacting both Hezbollah in Lebanon and the regime in Syria and Iran in the region? Uh, I know this is like uh, more, maybe a one hour discussion, but if you can like uh, summarize uh, uh, this in, in a short answer. And uh, let's start with Makram. Makram, you're muted. Can you unmute? Okay. Your... Yeah, I just did. So if anyone is under any delusion, the real enemy of Hezbollah in Lebanon is not the political establishment. Neither is Israel. The real fear that Hezbollah has is against the revolution. Every time uh, they try to hijack the revolution like they did on the 17th of October or just like they did yesterday by allowing their Shiite, uh, Shiite base, so to speak, to riot against uh, demand for electricity. This is not about electricity. And Hezbollah doesn't do politics. Hezbollah does politics on his spare time. It's, he does politics as a hobby. Uh, he is going after the revolution. And one of the major sins of the revolution is basically not uh, calling the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is Hezbollah. And as long as we do not acknowledge this and face this elephant, we are done for. Actually, Lebanon is, uh, is, is finished. Lebanon is finished because they're even going after institutions such as the institution I work for. They don't like to see the American University of Beirut or the Jesuit University or any of the institutions which stood by the revolution and said that you need to reform or you need to leave. Simply Hezbollah will keep killing and then ask questions later. And I told you why, because no one could hold them accountable and because this is the only thing they know how to do. Nasrallah was quick to accuse us of being agents of the different embassies. And you don't need to read Nasrallah. You read his uh, his toilet paper of newspapers, and here I'm talking about Akbar, which call us agents, and these people and their, uh, their, their mouthpieces are people who eulogize bin Laden. If you had, didn't read the eulogy of Ibrahim al-Amin when, uh, when he cried over bin Laden, you should. And you should definitely read uh, when uh, he was uh, treading over Luqman's grave and justifying why Luqman's killing was okay. What should happen, and this is something we, we've been talking about for ages, is that this revolution should be decentralized and this revolution should not have names or heads. When you are branded as a leader of the revolution, you are put on a hit list. And this is exactly what they did by using the different security apparatuses and the different agencies in Lebanon, the decentralization of the security profession in Lebanon. You mentioned, Hanin, that the Lebanese army. Lebanese army is good. For me, as a former basketball player, I use the Lebanese army 
to box out Hezbollah. We want distance, social distancing in a way. We don't want Hezbollah to come closer, but we cannot take them on on an open battlefield. The martyr square is too big for us. We need to go to the regions. We need to go to the diaspora. And more importantly, and this is something that Alia can talk about, go after Assad and make them hurt. The, the, the collapse of the Lebanese economy has to do with the fact that Assad and his goons were embezzling our money, our dollars, and the whole Ponzi scheme, which Riyad Salemi and all of these people were part of. And unfortunately, the majority of the Lebanese put their money in banks for 15% return on investment. This is a Ponzi scheme. A drug dealer doesn't make an, this much money. And we deserve losing this because we trusted a banking system which turned into uh, uh, simple, uh, they're, they're loan sharks in a way. And now they're trying to convince us that simple cosmetic uh, uh, measures can, uh, can jumpstart this economy. This economy is done for, and I, got, I have reached the conclusion, the personal conclusion, that you should not allow anyone to rebuild this temple using the same stones. This doesn't mean that we don't, Lebanon, don't want Lebanon that we call for, but simply we should not allow these masons to build them and not use the same building blocks. These building blocks are radioactive. And to go back to the main idea, we should make these politicians radioactive. We should make the people of Lebanon not come close to these people because they should pay for their support of this clientelist system and they this support for these warlords and for these people who go as far as Yemen to kill and wreak destruction. Thank you. Uh, Ali, please. Uh, uh, I will summarize uh, for, for, the last team, for the last three people. I will summarize in Arabic. Anyway. Sorry, I'm just saying for the live stream people, I will summarize everything that Ali said in, in English later. Go ahead. تفضل علي تفضل. يعني أنا بدي أقول إنه السؤال أنا أريد أن أقول أنه يجب أولاً بنظرة تاريخية سريعة أنه أولاً الطائف الشيعي على وجه العموم وأي متابع يعلم ذلك تاريخ الطائف الشيعي سواء بلبنان أو على مستوى الدول العربية وطبيعتها هي طبيعة متنوعة بمعنى أنه أيضاً الفكرة الشيعية قائمة على فكرة أساسية دائما ما يتحدث عنها الشيعة على وجه العموم هي فكرة الاجتهاد يعني فكرة الاجتهاد بما تعني من فكرة التنوع وفكرة الاختلاف وفكرة التعددية هذه طبيعة البيئة الشيعية تاريخيا وهنا أتحدث عن لبنان على الأقل وهو كما قلت على المستوى العربي لكن في لبنان منذ نشأة لبنان هذه الطائفة فيها تنوع ولم تكن في مرة من المرات تشكل عصب يعني واحد أو أنها تحت قيادة واحدة أو ممسوكة من جهة واحدة لا شك أن الإيديولوجيا الإيرانية التي دخلت لبنان منذ عقود بدأت تصادر شيئا فشيئا المنابر الدينية أولا وهي حاولت وسعت ونجحت إلى حد كبير في السيطرة على مختلف المنابر الدينية داخل البيئة الشيعية استخدمت المال والسطوة الأمنية من أجل السيطرة وهي خاضت حروب سابقة مع حركة أمل وأيضا فريق حزب الله الذي كان يمثل هذا الوجود الإيراني أيضا قام بجملة اغتيالات طالت شخصيات في البدء يعني وأتحدث عن مرحلة الثمانينيات يعني أشخاص من من أصحاب يحملون أفكار يسارية أو قومية أو ما إلى ذلك ممن كانوا يعكسون حالة التنوع داخل البيئة الشيعية هناك مسار ساهم أيضا سوريا النظام السوري في دعم هذا المسار وانطلق بشكل عنيف بعد العام 2005 والذي يعني استفاد من خروج النظام السوري من لبنان الجيش السوري وأحكم السيطرة 
بشكل كامل وكما قلت مستفيدة من الإيديولوجيا من البعد الأمني والعسكري ولا أقول المقاومة لأن المقاومة بما معناه ضد الاحتلال الإسرائيلي هي نشأت منذ ما قبل حزب الله وكان في وجود وحتى حققت إنجازات بين العامين 82-85 قبل أن يكون حزب الله حاضرا بقوة فبالتالي موضوع المقاومة هو دائما كان أيضا يمثل تنوع داخل البيئة اللبنانية والبيئة الشيعية إنما كان الاحتكار المقاومة بقرار من النظام الإيراني وسوريا والنظام السوري ولأهداف إقليمية كل ذلك برأيي عزز من استثمر حزب الله أيضا في اللعبة الطائفية وعزز سيطرته أكثر فأكثر بالسلاح بإلغاء الآخرين بالمال بالنفوذ العسكري والأمني المتاح له كبندقية لها بين مزدوجين حرية تحرك وشرعية في لبنان وأصبحت أقوى من الدولة كل ذلك أدى إلى النقطة الجوهرية برأيي أيضا لعززت من هذا الانغلاق هو أيضا الدخول في الحرب السورية وفي الحروب على مستوى المنطقة لأن حزب الله حين ذاك اعتمد أسلوب آخر في إمساك البيئة الشيعية اعتمد أسلوب أيضا يعني التخويف بمعنى أن هذه الحرب بسوريا في الوعي الشيعي هي حرب مع السنة وأن الشيعة محاطون اليوم بإسرائيل من جهة الجنوب وأيضا بسوريا في غالبيتها من السنة وأيضا كمان التعبئة بأنه حتى اللبنانيين الآخرين يريدون أن يعني أن يستهدفونكم في حال ضعف حزب الله حزب الله استخدم كل هذه التعبئة من أجل خلق حالة الخوف داخل البيئة الشيعية واستثمارها إلى الحد الذي يمكن أن يقول الشيعي العادي اليوم بأنه أنا يعني ليس لدي خيار في حال سقط حزب الله ما هو البديل يعني في سؤال هو له منطقه داخل البيئة الشيعية أنه في حال انتهى حزب الله أي دولة ستكون في لبنان وحزب الله كما نعلم أيضا يستثمر في تدمير الدولة فهو خلق هذا المناخ كل ذلك أيضا لم يؤدي إلى يعني بمعنى إلى الإطباق الكامل على البيئة الشيعية وأنا أعتقد منذ 17 تشرين يعني التحركات الأولى كانت داخل البيئة الشيعية وأظهرت الاعتراضات والتحركات داخل المناطق الشيعية في البداية عن جرأة عالية في مواجهة الثنائية الشيعية سواء أمل وحزب الله ودائما أريد أن أشير إلى أنه أمل هي العنصر الأضعف في هذه الثنائية وهي أنا أزعم بأن حزب الله يقود حركة أمل وليس هي الثنائية هي ثنائية بقيادة حزب الله لكن يستخدمها حزب الله لمصلحته وبالتالي الحالة الشيعية اليوم هي في حالة قلق وفي حالة أيضا تأثر من نتيجة الأزمة الاقتصادية المالية حزب الله يمكن أن يعين بعض المحاسبين الجزء من محاسبيه ما هم خارج محاسبيه ولكن هؤلاء لا يشكلون 15% أو 20% في الحد الأقصى من الأعداد الشيعة لكن في هناك 80% لا يستفيدون بالعكس يتضررون خاصة من انهيار العملة اللبنانية لجزء كبير من موظفي الدولة فيهم الموظفين وبالتالي هؤلاء يتأثرون بشكل مباشر فضلا عن الانهيار الاقتصادي اللي كمان أدى إلى إغلاق كثير من المؤسسات في أزمة صحيح حقيقية لكن هذه الأزمة حتى الآن هذا التململ لم يصل كما قلت إلى الحد الذي يهدد حزب الله إنما يجب هنا أن نشير إلى اغتيال لقمان سليم أنا برأيي الشخصي أحد الأهداف اغتيال لقمان سليم وتوجيه رسالة إلى البيئة الشيعية وليس لا إلى المسيحيين ولا إلى الطوائف الأخرى أو اللبنانيين ربما هناك جانب آخر لكن الجانب الأساسي هو توجيه رسالة إلى البيئة الشيعية بأنه أي وخاصة جاء في سياق حالة التململ وحالة إمكان أن يخرج شيء ما برأيي هذه الرسالة أدت إلى حد ما وظيفتها على الأقل مرحلياً بأنها فعلا خلقت نوع من الخوف خاصة الخوف الأكثر هو مثل اغتيال لقمان يعني بمعنى تعاطي الدولة اللبنانية مع اغتيال لقمان سليم كيف تعاطت الأجهزة كيف تعاطى القضاء يعني كل ذلك وفر أوراق إضافية لحزب الله جعله أيضا يوجه رسالة إلى البيئة الشيعية بأنه 
انه حتى لقمان سليم الذي يتمتع بعلاقات مميزه على الاقل قياسا لنخب عديده لبنانيه وهو له علاقات اوروبيه وامريكيه وشخص له دور ونفوذ انما يقتل لقمان سليم ولا يحصل اي يعني تعامل جدي حقيقي من قبل الاجهزه المعنيه او القضاء في مع هذه القضيه وهذا ايضا له هدف في توجيه هذه الرساله بتقديري مسار الامور حزب الله ليس في احسن احواله عندما يستعمل الاغتيال هو دليل ضعف عندما يصل الى مرحله من انه يستعمل القوه والتهديد بالشكل الذي نراه اليوم وترهيب الاخرين هو دليل ضعف ودليل تراجع وبتقديري انه بقاء الامور على ما هي عليه اليوم ستؤدي بطبيعه الحال بعد بالمرحله القريبه المتوسطه لكن ارجح انه سنشهد مظاهر من التفلت لكن ليس الى الحد الذي يعني يمكن ان يشكل بذاته عملية تغيير إذا لم يكن متكامل مع تطورات لبنانية وأقليمية تساعد على هذا على هذا النهوض وشكرا. Okay, just to summarize what Ali said, I know there is simultaneous translation within the Zoom. Uh, everybody under, heard him in English, but there are some people on the live stream that I just to summarize this. Um, uh, Ali thinks that the Shia community historically is very diverse, and that's based on the concept of al ishtihad uh, within the uh, uh, Shia theology. And Iran has controlled re religious platforms, mainly when they came to Lebanon. Uh, but not only that, they also used money and arms and started the assassinations in the 80s. Mm -hmm. not, not, this is not recent. They started the assass assassinations as soon as Iran formed uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, Eventually, this evolved, and like when when uh, when the Syria uh, revolution broke, and then Hezbollah got involved more involved in the region, and their and their regional role grew. They started to use the factor of fear of the Sunnis in in Syria and the rest of the region. So. In addition to everything they've done in Lebanon, the other tool is really like the factor of fear of the others, uh, uh, the, the Sunnis in general in the region, but mainly in Syria. Today, with all these factors and layers that uh, Iran and Hezbollah has employed in Lebanon, the Shia today ask, they have the discontent is growing, but they are asking today, what's really the alternative? If we do not have Hezbollah, who is going to help us? Who is going to protect us? Especially that Hezbollah managed to destroy state institutions. So the Lebanese state is not really the alternative. Uh, so yes, the Shia today are afraid. They're concerned about the future. They are suffering from economy and collapse and they're showing signs of discontent, but this still is not too threatening for Hezbollah but it might be. And that's why uh, Ali uh, wanted to bring up again the issue of the assassination of Luqman Slim, and he thinks that this is mainly uh, because of uh, a mainly a message to the Shia community who were showing many signs of discontent recently and for the Shia community to understand that any sign of uh, discontent is going to be met with violence. But this is also a sign of, of fear, and this is a sign of weakness on behalf of Hezbollah, and it needs to be utilized not only in Lebanon, but in any regional development. Keep in mind that Hezbollah is feeling also the fear and the weakness. Um, this is just a summary of, of, of well, what Ali said. And now I would like Alia to just answer briefly my question before we move to the q and I, uh, uh, I have a list of questions already in the chat box, in the Q&A box. So I will be asking them as soon as Alia uh, answers us. Please go ahead. Okay, first let me uh, let me uh, comment on what uh, my friend Makram said about Lebanon is finished. The region is finished here, Makram. Uh, yesterday they were destroying uh, 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 a very old and heritage uh, coffee shop in Damascus just for the Iranians. They want the land to build their own project, their own touristic place uh, on it. Uh, 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 Hanin, you were asking about uh, uh, the collapse. Yesterday, uh, the lira, the Syrian lira reached for the dollar reached 4,000 liras. At the same time, it was reaching 10,000 here. It's, it, and it is uh, the same collapse happening. And it is uh, the Caesar Act. We, we cannot forget the Caesar. 
yes, it is affecting them. And Bashar al-Assad said a few weeks ago that uh, he blamed the Lebanese for not being able to, to get the dollars from Lebanon. He's saying he was taking the dollars and he was uh, doing with his businessmen. And we don't forget that this uh, uh, Lebanese government gave uh, uh, the Lebanese nationality to those corrupted uh, Syrian businessmen. So they, uh, they make it easier for them to, to do the money laundry and to finance the Syrian regime uh, criminal acts in Syria. Uh, concerning uh, the, the, what happened in, in Beirut uh, in August, they don't believe, the Iranians don't believe we are states. They, mentioned, they say it publicly many times, from Tehran to Baghdad to Damascus to Beirut, it is their region. That's why we don't, you know, what happened in, in Beirut, it is related to what was happening in Syria. And Luqman talked about it before he was assassinated. They were using the Lebanese uh, uh, port to, to uh, uh, import some uh, TNT and many different, uh, I don't know, the chemical names for uh, their bombs. And they were using it to kill the Syrian people. And what happened is that they did not use this shipment, all of, uh, of the uh, shipment, and uh, it exploded. How? I don't know. And they are not willing, Hezbollah, Nasrallah was very clear about it. They are not willing for any real investigations. Khalas, we killed you, uh, uh, open a new page and uh, forget about it. They don't believe. I don't think we can uh, find a solution to Hezbollah and mainly to the Iranians militia in Lebanon without finding a solution in Syria and in Iraq. It's a chain. We have to work on all levels, not just in Lebanon. Yeah, and that's why I don't, yeah, I don't feel any solutions will be with the French initiative. It's a kind of uh, giving Panadol to a cancer, uh, uh, yeah, someone, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this, this brings me to, to a really important issue, and I urge all the speaker to give it a thought while we're answering the other, uh, just maybe for concluding remarks is um, there's a big question today, you know, with the, for, for, the, for the US and the international community in general in, in Lebanon's policy. Do we dissociate Lebanon's policy from Iran's policy? Or do you think that uh, Lebanon's policy should be part of Iran's policy? Or maybe should there be separate policies, one for Lebanon and one for Hezbollah? Like, do you think this is something that should be, like Alia, you seem to be thinking that it should be one and the same. I would like to hear from uh, Makram and Ali about that. But that's for your concluding remarks, just, just a big uh, question. I would like to start taking questions from the audience. Uh, I'll try my best to, to, to get everyone. Uh, there's a question about the Shia community being prevented from getting information. Do you think, Ali, that the Shia community is being prevented from getting information? Uh, or do they have access to, to, to the information? Is it catered for them? What, what, do, what do you think? Uh, I'll take another question. Uh, yeah, no. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's fine. Go ahead. Mm. بالتأكيد يعني بمعنى إنه تفتقد البيئة الشيعية لأي منبر مختلف عن حزب الله كل عملية الضخ الديني والإيديولوجي والسياسي تتم من منابر مصادرة من حزب الله المؤسسة الشيعية سواء رسمية كالمجلس الإسلامي الشيعي الأعلى أو الإفتاء الجعفري وعلى فكرة المجلس الإسلامي هو بمفهومه مجلس متنوع ولكن مصادر من قبل حزب الله وكل المنابر الدينية وكل التعبئة التي تحصل وأي صوت مختلف داخل البيئة الشيعية تجري يجري عملية تخوينه والهجوم عليه والتهديد وهناك نماذج عديدة يمكن ملاحظتها إما من خلال الذين أبعدوا أو تم ترهيبهم وإبعادهم وإما الذين سكتوا لم يعودوا يتحدثوا بمنطق مختلف لذلك التحليل والتفسير الواحد يأتي من منبر حزب الله ويوجه من خلال وسائل متعددة ومتنوعة بمعنى على سبيل المثال حتى على مستوى وهذا أنا برأيي وسائل الإعلام 
قد لا يكون لها تأثير كبير فيما أقول لكن حتى في موضوع وسائل الإعلام لاحظتم أخيرا أنه بالمناطق عندما يعني جرى نشر أو عرض بعض برامج معينة على محطات مثلا كما قالت كانت ببرنامج لديما صادق والتي اتهمت فيه حزب الله بقتل لقمان سليم على سبيل المثال وديما صادق يعني هي أكيد لبنانية وكذا ولكن يجب أن نشير إلى أنها أيضا شيعية عندما تحدثت عبر محطة الام تي في في برنامجها واتهمت حزب الله بقتل لقمان سليم تم منع هذه المحطة من أن تشاهد في مناطق التي يسيطر عليها حزب الله والمناطق الشيعية تحديدا وكذلك محطة الجديد يعني التي هي بالأصل قريبة من حزب الله بالأصل يعني يعني تعتبر ليست بعيدة عنه ولكن أيضا حتى الهامش الحري التي الذي عبرت عنه وفي موقف كان مستاء من حزب الله قرر بأن يمنع أن ترى الجديد على مثل في هذه المناطق هذا هذا يعني وهذا أنا أقول جانب على أهميته ومخالف للقوانين ولكن هو هو الأقل شأنا من الأمر الأساسي الذي تم من خلاله إلغاء كل كل مصادر يعني ما يمكن أن يبث إلى الجمهور الشيعي تحديدا سواء على المستوى الديني أو على المستوى السياسي أو حتى على يعني على مستوى الرسمي لكل مصادر من قبل حزب الله. Okay, uh, so short short answer to this question is, uh, uh, yeah, it's very difficult for the Shia to access information, especially we have certain examples of, of certain Lebanese local news that uh, TVs that have been uh, uh, the access to certain uh, news TV uh, channels have been cut in Dahi, the southern suburbs of Beirut, for example, or in Shia areas. They, uh, they It's becoming more and more and more difficult for the Shia community to access uh, certain information, especially especially when Hezbollah makes sure that uh, um, they attack and discredit everything that is against them. So it's it's becoming even harder. Uh, but this is nothing compared to everything else that Hezbollah is doing on terms of cultural, religious, and uh, uh, like the, the the control is not just through the news, it's through cultural institutions, religious institutions, and all the platforms. So this is something that uh, a soft power they have that needs to be addressed. Um, I will take the next question. And uh, I would like the speakers to be brief because we have uh, a lot of questions and I'd like to cover, to cover them all if we can. Uh, so we have a question about um, uh, opposition formation. So do you, I think this is more for Makram. Do you see any hope for the formation of an opposition front to confront the mafia militia control of the country and to coordinate actions, protests, political programs, elections? And what is preventing this unity from happening? Also, is it true that the Sunni community today is rallying behind Saad al-Hariri and his alliance with Hezbollah and away from the revolution? Uh, Makram, if you can briefly answer this yeah. question. Uh, simply, there is a front being uh, formed. However, the major problem is ego. Ego, because many of the people, including I saw a question here, people believe that we can change through elections. Come on, guys. We have our own Nancy Pelosi. His name is Nabi Birri. Even if you get the majority of the parliament, and ironically, we have had the majority for ages. But the last time March 14 won the election, we were prevented from voting. You're not allowed to vote unless you vote for Hezbollah's guys. And ultimately, if anyone here thinks that we can win an election that is rigged by the fact that there's gerrymandering of the electoral law, and more importantly, people cannot go and vote because in Hezbollah-controlled areas, the electoral uh, screen does not exist. If you are not a loyal supporter of Hezbollah, you are not allowed to leave your premise to go vote. This is very important. And more importantly here, I think, that the traditional political parties who are not part of the corrupt political class. And here, uh, if I may, the Lebanese forces and the Kata'ib, the Lebanese forces are guilty of helping uh, Michel Aoun get to power. However, they are not implicated in corruption. This they, And I know that Joe now will, uh, will go after me by trying to defend what 
Samir Jaja did. Everyone does mistakes. So this is a cardinal mistake which we all paid for. More importantly, political parties only know elections. This is very normal. But as individuals, we should not be obsessed with elections. Why vote for democracy when democracy doesn't exist? We want to talk about sovereignty and to regain the pillars of the state. Then we talk about uh, elections. If we win student elections in a couple of universities, this is a red herring. Don't go there. They want us to go for elections to claim that they represent the majority of the Shiites, the majority of the Sunnis. And to answer you uh, in conclusion, the Sunnis are nowhere to be found. And uh, Saad al-Hariri represents Hezbollah and doesn't represent the Sunnis with all due respect to the Sunnis of Lebanon. Sorry, you, so, can, can you talk a little bit about that, uh, the Sunni community and, and the leadership? The, the, Sunni, the, Sunni, the Sunni, Sunni community, the Sunni yeah. community st start to stop, stop defending uh, Saad al-Hariri. They still like him and I like him as a person. He's a, he's a fun guy and everything. But he has taken us down a very dangerous road by his, uh, the nexus that he established with Gibran Basile and all the corrupt business deals which were conducted under the auspices of Nadir, his, uh, his cousin. More importantly here that uh, the, uh, the Sunnis of the regions, the peripheries have been abandoned by the Gulf. Now we see a whole different ball game happening in the Tripoli and the north of Lebanon by the Turks and the Qataris trying to, uh, to be visible, whereas the Emiratis do care about the Sunnis, but they're not willing to invest. We cannot talk about the Sunnis supporting anyone here in Lebanon as long as Saudi Arabia has stopped caring for Lebanon. The Saudis have an important role to play in getting this so-called Sunni giant to reawaken. All right. Thank you very much, Makram. But I still want an answer to the following question. Sorry, I keep like probing on this, but who, who, who can, who, um, what is the Sunni community's leadership today? Who is this leadership? Is it headless, completely headless? And what does that mean in terms of uh, when everything collapses and there is like a huge part of Lebanon that has no political leadership? What does that mean? Headless is not just the term, it's brainless in the sense that they believe that they can allow Hezbollah to control the government and they can give the one third veto power to Hezbollah and to Zubran Basit and get away with it. They cannot bankroll this economy on the five billion uh, loan that they supposedly want to get from the IMF. This is a sinking ship and any cargo which is put on this ship will sink down with this, with this, this non-existent ship, so to speak. Okay, so, but this brings me to the next, sorry, yeah, go ahead. If you, if you allow me, yes. uh, the, it's headless in the region, not just in Lebanon. Uh, look at, again, Syria and Iraq. Because the Gulf abandoned the, uh, the Sunni and the uh, majority of this region, uh, Turkey is playing a role, but they are playing it differently with supporting the Islamists. The Islamists will, not, will never uh, represent the majority of the Sunnis. That's why you find the Sunnis are you know, losing their, uh, their battle because they don't have anyone to represent them or to defend, defend what they really want in this region. So do you, are you it's saying- It's getting yeah. com very complicated now with, with the Biden administration so worried about the human rights in Saudi Arabia and in, and in Egypt and uh, uh, not mentioning the human rights in Lebanon or in Syria or in Iran even. They are not talking about it. And it's funny about election, they are uh, convincing the Syria, uh, Syrian people to uh, go for elections. And Bashar al-Assad, after killing uh, uh, half a million Syrians, they want him to, to be defeated by elections. So is there, a, is there a concern? Would there be a concern that Lebanon is going to become a battlefield like Syria is at one point where it will be Islamist extremists at one point, the Turkish uh, 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 intervention, like fit, trying to fill the space, uh, uh, the gap I mean, by the Saudis, or maybe uh, Israeli strikes happening in Lebanon as they are in Syria. Uh, yes, go ahead, then. Well, uh, let me put on my historian hat. I've studied the Lebanese Civil War. Uh, at the start of the war in 1975, everyone was investing here. 
the IRA were sending their people here. We had the Tigers of the Tamil training here. No one cares about Lebanon. No one will fund will will even fund a soccer match between the Sunnis and the Shiites. This obsession that the civil war will destroy everything and then we can rebuild again with someone like Hariri and the Saudis saying the well, this will never happen. The only way out of this uh, this crisis is for us to admit that we have empowered a corrupt political class and they in turn have have empowered Hassan Nasrullah and his band of killers. This is the only way out of this. A civil war will not happen. People will starve. No, no, people, no. Will, people will... Not a civil people. war, but like a battlefield kind of... Uh... Battlefield between, between who? Between who? Hezbollah keeps on beating people up and uses the Lebanese army sometimes and the security apparatus another time. There is no battlefield. The battlefield is in people's fridges and in the empty shelves of the pharmacy and potentially in a number of institutions that will close. In 1975, we had over 70 daily newspapers. People were pumping money into Lebanon. Now, no one is pumping money. Everyone is pumping money out of Lebanon. Don't you see, do you, so you're saying that there will be no uh, confrontation between Iran and Israel in Lebanon anymore? This well, is it's, happening, it's happening in Syria and uh, the Israeli Air Force is surgically uh, killing these people. And ultimately, the Democrats want to be obsessed with just putting the Gulf is uh, in line with human rights. What about human rights in, uh, in, in Syria? What about human rights uh, in Yemen? The Houthis are going after everyone. What about human rights in Iraq when gunning down Hisham al-Hashimi? This is where people, there's no, there's no difference between a Sunni killer and a Shiite killer and even a Baha'i killer. Everyone killed should be held accountable. That's important for any administration, be it Bernie Sanders, who runs uh, the White House, or Biden, or Kamala Harris, or everyone. Kamala Harris actually called Bashar al-Assad a dictator. And these red lines should be enforced. I'm not talking about going to war every time anything happens, but you cannot back away from the fight. The stick and the carrot should always be on the table. Okay, so I'm going to summarize the rest of the questions and ask you to do your concluding remarks and answer some of them. So. One main question is, Makram, you said like a way out is to admit, but that's not really a way out. Like this is the first step in the way out. What is really the way out? Like really, what, what, what should be done in Lebanon today? And this brings me to the second question that I asked earlier. Uh, is, does that mean a way out in Lebanon should be part of a policy that is a regional policy? Lebanon should be part of an Iran policy or should we dissociate Lebanon's policy from Iran's policy? Uh, and while thinking of this way out that I would like you all to, to talk about, like what is the, the solution for, for Lebanon today and how can the international community and the Biden's administration uh, play a role? So what, is the, what are the tools and how to uh, uh, resolve the situation before Lebanon officially becomes a failed state and total chaos uh, uh, happens. So uh, let's let's start uh, with with uh, Alia, Ali, and and then Makram. Finally, hey. reverse order. Alia. خليني خليني أقول بداية تعليقا على الزميلين اللي قالوا أنا بدي أقول المنطقة مدمرة بالكامل. يعني ما فينا نقول ولا للحظة إنه هناك انتصار شيعي وهزيمة سنية في الواقع الشيعة مدمرون والسنة مدمر المنطقة بكاملها مدمرة يعني ليس هناك من صعود شيعي وهبوط سني بالعمق هناك تدمير شامل يطال كل المجتمعات على مستوى إذا تحدثنا العراق سوريا لبنان وحتى داخل إيران إذا بدنا نوصل داخل إيران أنا أريد أن أقول بالنسبة للبنان كل الحلول وكل الأفكار وكل الأراء تسقط عند نقطة أساسية هي حل المعضل الأساسي المتمثل بثنائية الدولة والدويلة أو ثنائية السلاح الشرعي والسلاح غير الشرعي عدم معالجة هذه المهمة أو هذه القضية أي حل لا انتخابات لا أي تطور سياسي أي اتفاق سياسي لا يمكن أن يؤدي إلى أي حلول لأنه هم طبيعة الدول والأخطر أن الاستراتيجية الإيرانية تقوم ونحن يجب أن نعترف أن النفوذ ودور حزب الله في لبنان إذا كان لدى البعض وهم أنه هو ناتج عن قوة ذاتي هو ليس 
الناتج عن قوه ذاته وتفوق على اللبنانيين ليس بسبب قوته انما بسبب الدور الايراني والنفوذ الايراني يجب ان نفصل حزب الله عن عن ايران مطلقا في مساله دوره ونفوذه في لبنان وبالتالي معالجه هذا الموضوع لا يمكن ان تفصل عن في الامرين والنقطه الاساسيه لا اريد ان اطيل يمكن نحكي كثير بهالمجال لكن النقطه الاساسيه والجوهريه حل معضله السلاح غير الشرعي في لبنان او ثنائيه الدوله والدويله. Okay, great. Uh, just to summarize this for the people who are on live stream, uh, Ali is saying that the whole region, not just Lebanon, is collapsing. So this is something that we should look at, like Lebanon is part of the whole region. So uh, we shouldn't separate the two things, Lebanon from the Iran policy, uh, because every single solution in Lebanon, every single way out of Lebanon will always face one main hindrance, that is, Hezbollah's illegal arms, the Iranian arms in Lebanon. And this is the main question. If we do not solve the uh, state within the state problem, and if we do not really resolve the Hezbollah arms issue in Lebanon, there will be no way out. It's very simple. So Ali saying no, no dissociation in the two uh, 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 policies. Um, Alia? Yes, I don't believe uh, uh, there will be any solution for Lebanon without the region. And uh, about what can we do? Uh, it's difficult, but we are waiting now for the Biden administration and the nuclear deal, deal uh, the new uh, nuclear deal. And uh, honestly, we are not hearing anything about uh, uh, talking with the Iranians about their role in the region. Uh, they are repeating the same uh, like Obama's did. It's about the nuclear issue, it's about uh, the Israeli and the missiles, but not about the region and the role the Iranians are playing. Maybe what can we do is to, uh, politically speaking, to create a, a, a group of uh, a lobby in, in, in DC or in, uh, in America to, to start yeah, focusing on our issues, it's not the nuclear. I don't care if, the, of course, I care if the Iranians has a nuclear weapon, but I, I do care about the Iranians' militia in Syria and in Lebanon and in Iraq. They are threatening, threatening me much more than uh, the nuclear issue. Yeah, I think the operations, Iran's operations in the region is something that this administration is addressing. I, I, I believe it's... Uh, and no, no one should believe that the Russians will kick the Iranians out, please. After you know, they I promised this in 2015, and they gave them the rest of Syria. And some people are still waiting for the Russians to kick the Iranians. It yeah. will not work like this. Okay. Uh, Makram, last word yes. for you. Uh, if I may, uh, this is not really uh, this com that complex. The problem in Lebanon is simply that no one is playing by the rules. We have a constitution. It's not a perfect constitution, but it was working as long as people admitted that it existed. The problem is the fact it's not the sectarian system. If you play by any rule, even though it's bad, okay, if you keep on doing and, and abusing it in a way that it does not collapse, it could work. The issue is here that you should continue sanctioning these people. These people are really scared by their, uh, they're really scared by sanctions. And they really like uh, uh, Macron. Look at Macron. Macron uh, has been, they spat in his face, they made fun of him. He came as a hero and left as a defeated, uh, a defeated conqueror. He's like the modern day Napoleon. Okay? He keeps on talking the talk, but he does not walk the walk. He should both talk the talk and walk the walk. The issue is not about what will Lebanon give the United States. The United States simply, should not care about Lebanon, but should care about the fact, go ahead with the nuclear deal. The nuclear deal has to be enforced, but we have other problems. We have the ballistic missiles, and more importantly, we have the problem of Iran's behavior in the region. And it's not about the behavior of only shooting people. It's about making life impossible for us. It's by making everyone a Khashoggi and everyone a Luqman Slim. And this is your personal responsibility that for any diplomat who wants to come to Lebanon, pass by David Shanker at the Washington Institute, and let him tell you how you should deal with these diplomats, how, how to deal with these 
Lebanese political elite. These people are liars. They are where the people that ask for demar demarcation talks and then they weasel out. We have oil in the sea. This should not be accessed as long as we don't bring back the judiciary and ultimately put people in jail. Hezbollah cannot survive without the Jibran Basil and these people to uh, defend him and to convince people that the only way out for the Christians of the Levant is that this stupid alliance of minorities, which is so bad that I think it's an existential threat to anyone who believes that Jibran Basil and Bashar al-Assad and this band of killers can actually protect them. Thank you. All right. Um, I think I covered all the questions and I think you covered my questions. Unless you have anything else to say, uh, we can uh, we can conclude. But before that, I just want to say two things that um, things are happening in Lebanon very fast and there isn't a good option for Hezbollah so far. Their only hope of a quick relief is now no longer uh, an option. Their option is really between losing the support of the people, losing the access to institutions or losing control. And this is something that needs to be leveraged. Uh, Lebanon is not a fails, it's not bankrupt really. Like the, the resources are there. You don't need to bail out Lebanon. I think the most important thing to Day really is to uh, enforce reforms, enforce a political solution, a real political solution, and then Lebanon's economy will will be revived on its own. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really need much. Uh, I think the speakers have already highlighted these things. Um, I would like to thank you all. Uh, I know it's late in Beirut now, so I would I will I will let you go. Uh, it's uh, probably around your um, at night time. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank. Thank you for the speakers for your amazing insights uh, and and please be careful uh, stay in touch and uh, uh, and let me know if you need anything uh, thank you very much and um, have a good day thank you everyone thank you honey thank you bye bye bye